but if, for those who don't know myself and Jonathan, I'm very obviously Sinead, and we all <laughs> managed to figure that bit out. Mm -hmm. um, and this is Jonathan O'Reilly. I'm a, a social work team leader in, with the Child and Family Agency. I currently lead a, um, a team of children and care social workers. Jonathan is on what we call another pillar. I know the language is great, but that's what we call it. Um, Jonathan would be on more of what we call a front door pillar. He'd be involved in child protection and welfare. So he would deal, him and his team, um, would deal a lot with families soon after they come into contact with our services um, and would probably, from a, a daily practice level, Jonathan and his team and, and similar teams within the area would use the science of safety model in terms of implementing um, frameworks up to reunify reunification with families and children. Um, I suppose I'm going to make a show, I'm going to make a small disclaimer. Um, sorry, I'm told to stand over here. Um, I'm going to make a. I thought my voice was loud enough. My children certainly say it is. Um, I'm going to make a small disclaimer. Um, I know there's lots of people in the room here, um, and we thank you to all the speakers this morning. I hope that we're not going to end up repeating um, a lot of what's been said in terms of research, in terms of the legal stuff. Um, and I know certainly in terms of the science of safety piece, I think it's going to demonstrate a lot of the bits that have been spoken to this morning about how we found that it works um, in the context of statutory social work and addresses a lot of the pieces, I think, that have been highlighted in all, all the, the um, kind of information that's been given to us this morning. Um, we're not experts and we don't proclaim to be experts and um, I think this morning we might have been introduced as part of a team of experts in what we do um, so I guess we're not experts but what we do have is a lot of experience between us in terms of working in statutory childcare social work. I know we're probably a rarity um, in, in current days but I suppose when myself and Jonathan sat down and looked at the amount of experience that we had it was slightly frightening because it actually goes into decades um, now that might be more in Jonathan's favour, my favour, I don't know. <laughs> um, you know, and we let you all keep that confident, whatever you think. Um, so I suppose, look, we heard lots this morning in terms of what you, reunification is. Um, I suppose from the child and family's perspective, um, we would feel very much that reunification starts at the very point that a child is received into care. And I know that that's sometimes not always how we're perceived. And, particularly hearing Fiona, Fiona's mum from, uh, from Epic, I think that's often how it feels to parents because we are part of an arbitrary process, um, inevitably, and, and I suppose more often than ever in my years of practice, we land ourselves before the district court and Judge Sims quite regularly. Um, so even in that association, we become a very arbitrary nature. Um, going back, I suppose, to, to the earlier point this morning in terms of having a compassionate response. Again, I think your point earlier in terms of em empathy and compassion is really p powerful. And I know certainly, speaking from my own experience, um, certainly the teams that I work with, I couldn't fault them in terms of the compassionate response that they have to the families that they work with. But a big challenge in that, I think, is the social worker or the social work teams having to navigate all the other elements around that, the, the, the law, the arbitrary nature of bringing a matter to court, building a relationship, trying to communicate that in that relationship you're trying to build trust with a family so that they trust you when you try to implement the plans um, for returning a child home. Um, so I guess in terms of that, you know, it is about returning a child back to the safe care of their parent. Um, and it's, it starts at the point that they come into care and for us it's through the period that they're in care, and it does, I think, has been emphasised by, by many before, it needs to continue beyond the point of a child returning home. And sometimes, again, I think people th don't think that we factor that in. I think people feel that we try to drop the gauntlet as, as soon as we can from a statutory level point of view. Um, and I, again, I hope today that maybe we'll demonstrate that that's not the case and, and that there's a, a sort of a, a bigger picture around that. Um, when we kind of spoke to people in the office and spoke to colleagues around this in terms of what they felt reunification in you know what made it work helped us to get it right i guess what struck me a lot really was about how everybody how everybody seems to have the same approach whatever way you frame it whether it's in science of safety whether it's a different framework whether it's about building trusting relationships with family whether it's about representing the best interest of the child or the voice of the parents whatever the case may be I think, it, it, and, and you know, talking to colleagues, talking to people within the social work department, talking to people outside of the social work department. Um, and I think today, in, in, in what we've heard this morning, I think we are all singing from the same hymn sheet in terms of 
what the purpose and function um, of reunification is. And certainly that theme of doing it quickly versus doing it right is something that comes up a lot. Um, I think as social workers and, and professionals, we often feel under pressure because of timelines of, of, of court, because of timelines of children to, to maybe do it fast. Um, and you know we're very, very cognizant and support that view that doing it as quickly as we can within the time frame of a child coming into care um, is, is probably got the best outcomes for children. But just because it can't happen, and I think we were talking earlier, Simon was talking earlier about the framework of maybe doing it within six months. Um, and I think, again, that is kind of research-based and evidence-based, that if you can do it within that time frame of six months, I know that's a huge period within a child's life. I'm very conscious I'm after walking away from this again. Um, that it's, you know, it's a huge period within a child and family's life. Um, but I suppose in terms of the many kind of pieces that need to be addressed, it's, it's not a huge chunk to, in order to get it right. And if you can't do it, just to say again, that if, if we're not able to make a reunification plan in that early couple of months um, in, in a child's journey in, in the care setup, like when, he come, when a child would come through the intake or child protection kind of part of the framework that Jonathan can talk more about, that doesn't mean that we rule it out. Um, reunification is a part of something that we do. It's something that is an integral part. Almost we don't think about it, and I, that I know comes across quite a lot, but I suppose it's everything that we do. Even if you don't do a reunification, if you start a reunification plan and we get to the point where we have to call it and say, this isn't going to work, that doesn't mean that we don't revisit that at different junctures throughout a, child, a child's journey through care. There is a statutory obligation on us um, to always consider reunification. Um, most often that is done within the children in care review process. Um, that can happen in the first, uh, twice a year for the first period and then it goes into a yearly review. But outside of that, most often when talking about implementing a care plan, a safe care plan and a meaningful care plan for a child, inevitably people talk about the possibility of a child returning to their birth family and sustaining and maintaining those relationships. So when and if the time comes that we can work with that positively rather than damaging those relationships. Um, so again, just to read from the slide, it starts at the point of admission to care and continues well after they return home. A speedy return from care is likely to be in the child's best interest where parents have fewer temporary difficulties, but where parental problems are harmful and more enduring, reunification needs to await it a way to reduction in those problems and I think that goes back to the earlier slide of, of rather you know, doing it correctly or doing it swiftly and it feeds into to Simon's piece earlier around having robust assessments, identifying a parent's capacity to understand the, the difficulties that have resulted in their child being um, removed from their care um, and it helps us to assess or work on the parent's capacity to understand the expectations that, that we as a the child and family agency, but also that the child may have when we enter into the process of looking at reunification. Um, reunification is what we do. It's not always what we. See. It's not just what. I suppose come back there. It's what we do. It's not that you see it all the time, but it's that bit that we are regularly reviewing it. Um, again, myself and Jonathan spoke about this a good bit, um, and no more than Dolan saying. Dolan saying when he did the straw. It, you know, of your colleagues and that in one hand you could count it. Um, success stories are quite limited within our time frame as I said it's a significant one. There are success stories and again I, I, it's the question about what is a success. Sometimes a success story isn't always the speedy return of a child. Sometimes the success story is getting the services, getting the supports, maintaining those relationships and then revisiting something like a reunification further down the line. Um, and I know from a lot of parents' point of views, point of view, they don't see that. They see it as trying to, to, to ground our decision to keep a child away from them. And a lot of, I find myself repeating a lot to, to families and to children, that our job isn't to make life difficult for them. I appreciate that it does, but that's not our intention. Our job is to try and see how we can support families to rebuild those relationships, to address the worries and the very real concerns that led to a child been unsafe or been happy so that we can now try to return that child home, whether that's within the child's time frame of a couple of months over a court period of year. Jonathan's telling me to hurry on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so on that basis, I suppose, when we talk about all of those bits in terms of assessments, in terms of 
incorporating the parent's voice and the child's voice in terms of looking at the legal frameworks. I suppose signs of safety is the piece that, ch that the Children and Family Agency have signed up to um, in terms of trying to implement all those pieces that we know about our learning. Um, in simple terms, it's a model of collaborative practice with children and their families and the communities with the aim of achieving best outcomes. It seeks to find family solutions to family problems, and I think that's a hugely important piece of it. Um, SOS can play a part in aiding the successful reunification alongside other models of practice. It's underpinned by best practice. It addresses all those key findings that Simon referenced in terms of assessment. It's about the clear assessment, it's about the child's voice, and it's really powerful for parents to understand what children want, how children have been impacted by the, by the issues. Um, Jonathan is going to do a case uh, study later on and he'll show you some of those bits in terms of, um, in, in a real life case that has been one of the successes in terms of reunification. So hopefully that will demonstrate how powerful that piece can be. Um, I think it's, from my own experience, parents seeing that bit is quite powerful. Um, the benefits of, S of SOS reunification planning is, uh, it increases the monitoring of the children at risk. There's professional oversight and 24-hour network safety. That is the piece where, yes, there's professionals, but there's also people in, in the family's network, in their community, um, it, or in their, you know, their, their base that is able to provide a safety network for them. It ensures clarity and transfer, transparency about our decisions, our decision-making to families. That's a theme that's come up quite a bit already this morning in terms of you know, and I think very powerfully through the EPIC presentation is that that mum didn't feel she had any clear um, plans or any clear transparency around what was going to happen and what the plans going forward were. Um, collaboration leads to motivation. We spoke about the importance of collaboration before, involving parents in it, making sure that they understand what's been asked of them, that they understand the plans. Collaboration, you know, I think ultimately leads to really positive engagement. And again, I know we spoke about that this morning, what is engagement, what's collaboration. Um, and it, it helps to motivate when, par when parents really understand what we're asking of them, rather than feeling that we're hiding information from them. Um, the science of safety process helps us to establish concrete expectations for families and the expectations that families have from us. And again, I think that's really, really important. Um, from our point of view, we have found that it really has assisted in terms of drift prevention. Um, having clear plans, setting proper meetings, having a means to communicate and to address issues as they present and as we go along in the process in, a, in the hope that we can address the problems rather than always been a problem and not having an answer. Um, the, the whole science of safety project and again in, in our, our case study you might see that. Um, it addresses that piece for the structure of access and access planning. Um, you know, Jeremy, you were just saying a few minutes ago in terms of the important for a contact plan and I think absolutely where we've all agreed in terms of a reunification. Our aim is to increase access and contact with families because again, access is a real window into the family, it's a real window into the areas that we need to help them and support them and it's also how child and family interact and what, where those supports might need to be needed if they, if they go back home. It provides clarity for the court about case progression and it demonstrates to the children our attempts to send them home because I think it's always important from the child's point of view that it's not just a case that they've entered into the care system and that nobody cared enough. Um, about what the outcome was. I think it's really important that there are clear and documented um, accounts of our efforts to hear the child's voice and to demonstrate to them that the people that are important to them have made every effort to get them home. Um, I'm going to hand you over to Jonathan now. He is going to talk you through a little bit more around the process of SOS and he will then go through the case study. Hi everyone. I'm going to try and stand here but I might drift as well. Um, so I'm just going to give you a whistle-stop tour of the process that we go through. Um, what I really should say as part of this is that what you guys see in court is um, when we're talking about parent capacity assessments, we're talking about, um, we're talking about residential detox, we're talking about the heavy hitters, what we call bottom lines. Um, this process is what we would like to see. This is the vision of what, when the child returns home, how it will look the child gradually returning home and what life will look like for the child when they return home. That starts with, pre um, with preparation with professionals. Um, we need to build confidence in the professionals. If a family has been known for years, we take a, ch a child into care that's been cumul cumulative harm, we're saying to them, yes, we, we have professionals that are going to continue working with the family, that's you guys. We are going to pull out because this child has an extended family around them. That 
sends people into orbit, they are worried that the social work department are not taking their their process seriously, that they're they're not taking um, they're not taking their role seriously. We very much take on board what Fiona said. We are a trigger to families ultimately, especially when we've taken a child into care. When they come back, when when we return a child home, we want a network of professionals and family to be around this. Um, to be around this child that can do our job. Us popping in once a week for an hour isn't providing safety to a family. Us finding a village, as was said earlier, around a family, that's providing safety to a child. Um, we prepare dangerous statements and safety goals. Um, you, you've heard all about those, but just, just to make the point that a, I suppose a well-written dangerous statement speaks to Donald's points about being really clear without being patronising as to not only what the worries are for a family, for a child, but what the parents, the parents' behaviours, how they have impacted and are damaging the child. Um, I'll just fly through a few of these. I said about developing um, professional bottom line requirements. That would be the likes of the parent capacity assessment, the detox, the protection order in DV cases, things like that. Um, um, we build a vision of the process for the family, so we really prepare them for what we're going to be doing. And then we build an informed network with the family. That is that this family, that the, the extended network around the family, be they a sister, a granny, a family friend, somebody in the church, as you'll see in my example, um, that they understand and they appreciate what we're worried about, and they're willing to work with the family to make that child safer. Um, we very much have to take into account that there are new communities, there are children who grew up in care that don't have those networks. It is something that I suppose maybe doesn't run along the signs of safety process, but we try our best to work with those, with those professional networks to build a network for the family. Um, then we go into the safety planning process. Um, I'm not going to go through these in, in great detail because I am going to be talking about the trajectory and timeline and I know that I'm, 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 I'm a little bit tight on time. Um, but they are effectively the, the, the tools that we use as part of the signs of safety approach um, in order to assess what life might look like for the, fa for the child when they go home in the knowledge that whatever has happened in the past is probably the greatest predictor of what could happen in the future without change. Um, I'll, be talking about, um, I'll be talking about the trajectory and timelines, but that is, again, as Sinead was saying, it's about preventing drift. It's about giving the family confidence that we're not planning to be around with this, with this family for a very long time if they work with us through this system. Um, but it also has to take into account the professional assessments or bottom line requirements that we have, that we have rec recommended. Um, and then a child-centred safety plan. Again, um, I think Fiona's mum was talking about the, the use of, or, or one of the parents was talking about the use of words and pictures. Um, bringing, this, bringing the worries that we have for the children into a language that they understand, not that, that you know, um, Alice was in care because mommy was sick, what does sick mean? Um, we need to give them a really child-centred version of the story of their life so they understand what reunification could look like and what we need to move towards. I'm going to leave these for you to read through at your own, at your own leisure um, and, and just talk about the case just to give you an example. I'm not saying that this is the perfect example of signs of safety, I'm not saying it's the perfect example of reunification, but it's one of my few examples of reunification, um, unfortunately. Um, I've anonymised as much as possible here. Um, no, I've anonymised everything, but there were three children, so um, that's, that's as much as is true. Um, Ruth, Ruby and Rosie were received into care when their dad left the country and didn't come back when he should. He said he'd be gone for a week. He, didn't come, he hasn't come back. Um, their mom suffered a mental health crisis which led to the children entering care. I'm going to show you a little bit about after the care process through the courts had been ongoing for a, few, a, a couple of months at this stage, where we were confident that mom was accessing the mental health support that she needed, where she was accessing the other supports that she needed, how we implemented the signs of safety approach to that. I'm not going to go through this because it's very detailed, but this is the trajectory that I was talking about earlier. You'll see in the meeting and monitoring section, there, were, there was preparation for, for, for network. This was, this was a family from, from a new community where it was difficult to find a network, but we did find a network in a neighbour, a pastor and his wife. Um, 
we did words and pictures. You're going to see a terrible version of it later. Um, and this was our plan. As you see, it, there was a preparation week. And then from weeks 1 to 13, I believe, um, was the move towards home. Um, in a sense, where we have found that reunification, where reunifications have been most successful in, in, the, few, in the last few years where there have been a few reunifications, it's, it's where there's been a, an acute mental health difficulty, that seems to be where this has been most effective for us um, in finding that safety. Um, by week 13, um, the children returned home. At that point, there had been safety planning around mom's mental health, about what, what happens if dad comes home, what changes what supports the children needed in the community, seeing as they were, they were quite new to the community that they were living in. Um, the children were well prepared as to what to look out for and what to do if they were worried about mum again. Um, that, was the, that was effectively the tra trajectory that was drawn up and presented to mum before all of this started, and it was successful. Um, you'll note there that they went home in week 13, and by week 21, we had stepped away from this family the network were proving what they needed to do. The professionals were working with the family, and we, we stepped it down to a metal where the professionals would continue working with the family. We just stood away. Sorry. <laughs> I'm not good at art. Um, so this is just giving you an example, and it's just to, to run through it before I go back to Sinead to, 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 uh, to wrap up. But this was Ruth Ruby and, Ro Ruth, Ruby and Rosie. That was them living at home with their dad. Um, I've only taken a few panels from it. Um, this was mum praying um, when her mental health started to deteriorate. Um, you'll notice that the language in it is at their level, um, I hope, without being too condescending. Um, this is mum having a vision. What you're not or seeing a vision, um, what you're not seeing on the right-hand side is uh, Ruby going to speak to the neighbour and the neighbour seeing that it was going to be OK. Um, skipping through it, a few terrible slides later. Um, uh, the social worker and mom had a really good think about what, um, about people that know mom and the girls. Mom knew that neighbors, Annie, Pastor Dimmy, and his wife, Ella, would like to make sure the children were always safe and happy. Lots of chats about how they can help the girls, check in on the girls, and always make sure they're safe, even if they're worried about mom. There was a couple more after that. That case closed. As I said, um, dad didn't come back. The family moved on, and it was it was a success story and one of the few. Um, I'm just going to hand you back to Sinead. So I think, as Jonathan was saying, there there are many aspects to the whole science of safety piece, um, and that was a whistle stop tour. Um, that doesn't mean that you know we can't implement it in 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 for longer periods of time. Um, I think. It was a success story. We don't have too many of them. But often, I suppose, at the, the other end of care, we do end up looking at that kind of framework and elements that come into that in terms of trying to plan for a child to go home or to make a permanent plan after they leave care. And um, One of the strong points, I think, is that the relationship that a child has with their family, whether it's good, bad, or indifferent, is the relationship that they have with their family. And we have to build on that, and we have to support on that if we want a child to be able to move on and, you know, in the future um, as an adult. Um, and the pieces when we talk about stepping out of the framework, um, I think it is really, really important that the child has somebody that they can confide in, that they can talk to. Very often that isn't the social worker at the time that they're in care it is, but when you're in a, a time when the child has gone back home, sometimes having the professionals, the child and family agency, the statutory agency standing over that, people do, and I think Fiona's mum you know, refer, referenced that, that you feel that there's someone looking over your shoulder all of the time. That doesn't mean that we, hopefully doesn't mean, our plan is that it doesn't mean that families are left on their own in the community. Um, I suppose there's a big plan around outside of the signs of safety model, but it feeds into to, to building up the networks that are there to support is that PPFS model where we try to work with the different services in the community, where the, the, we try to identify services that can form a network that aren't as arbitrary as the role that we would play in their day-to-day -day living when the child is in school or in, in care. Um, and through those more informal um, networks that have the oversight of Tusla in terms of managing that professional risk piece and um, lots of families do manage to successfully have their children return home to them. So hopefully that's kind of 
moved along quickly because we were tight in time, but hopefully that's kind of given people a picture um, of the science of safety for, um, framework. We're not saying it's the Bible, we're not saying it's the thing that everybody should use. Certainly within children and care, we sometimes struggle to implement all aspects of it, but there are certainly pieces of it. The bits that work, we have found, work quite powerfully. Um, and I think in terms of that kind of communication to either the courts or communications to the children and their family about what expectations is the real powerful bit. So hopefully that's been a